Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Brother Gary Lee. I'm pleased that you're with me again today as we consider the book of prophecy called Ezekiel, named after the author, of course. Uh, we're going to pick up where we uh, left off at chapter 16, and we'll be uh, beginning at verse uh, 35, Ezekiel 16, verse 35. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we do praise you and thank you for this special time that we have to study your word, to hear your voice, and apply lessons to our lives. Help us with your Holy Spirit so that these things may come to pass. Bless us now, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And amen. All right, let me adjust this a little bit. Okay. You can see the top of my head better now, can't you? <laughs> All right, we're going to read uh, verses 35 through 39 of Ezekiel 16. And this is where uh, judgment is announced against uh, Jerusalem. And notice what she's called. Here's what it says. Now then, O harlot. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your filthiness was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your harlotry with your lovers and with all your abominable idols and because of the blood of your children which you gave to them, surely therefore I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure all those you loved and all those you hated, I will gather them from all around against you and will uncover your nakedness to them, that they may see all your nakedness. And I will judge you as woman who, women who break wedlock or shed blood are judged. I will bring blood upon you in fury and jealousy i will also give you in to their hands and they shall sh throw down your shrines break down your high places they shall also strip you of your clothes take your beautiful jewelry and leave you naked and bare now this is obviously true judgment isn't it he says, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. God didn't address Israel uh, by any sort of no noble name. Their heart deserved a shocking address. O harlot. He says, I will gather your lovers in whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. The, the Lord spoke as the one who knows human nature. He knew that when people run after illicit lovers, uh, either literally or spiritually, some they may love, but others they will hate. He says, I will gather them from all around against you and will uncover your nakedness uh, with them. God promised to humble, even to humiliate Israel before her pagan neighbors. Uh, the beauty and adornment she had traded upon before the nations would be stripped away, and they would see what Israel was without God. Uh, can you imagine if America was seen what we are without God? I think some see it. He says, I will judge you as women who break wedlock and shed blood are judged. God would bring the punishment of death upon Israel. He would not kill the nations completely, but rain 
death upon them in judgment. God promised to bring this judgment with passion. I will bring, he said, blood upon you in fury and jealousy. Oh, boy, he's whipped up, isn't he? With good reason. He says, I will also give you into their hand. God promised that the judgment to come upon Israel would come through the very lovers she gave herself to. The neighboring nations and their gods by proxy would conquer and humiliate stubborn Israel. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, verses 40 through 43. Uh, this describes the coming judgment against Jerusalem, the harlot. Verse 40. They shall also bring up an assembly against you, and they shall stone you with stones and thrust you through with their swords. They shall burn your houses with fire and execute judgments on you in the sight of many women, I and I will make you cease playing the harlot, and you shall no longer hire lovers. So I will lay to rest my fury toward you, and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be quiet and be angry no more, because you did not remember the days of your youth, but agitated me with all these things. Surely I will also recompense your deeds on your own head, says the Lord God, and you shall not commit lewdness in addition to all your abominations. Uh, they shall bring up, it says in our text, it says they shall also bring up an assembly against you. The armies of the nations surrounding Israel would come against her in a divinely appointed judgment. Uh, the judgment would be complete with the stones of attack, the swords of war, and the fire of destruction. Oh, what a dismal picture it is of that uh, was coming upon uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Nevertheless, it was well-deserved. All right, our text says, I will make you cease playing the harlot, and you shall no longer hire lovers. The judgment God would bring upon them would be something of a cure of Israel's gross idolatry. After this judgment and exile, they would never have the same problem with the idols of the nations. <laughs> he says, so I will lay to rest my fury against you. God's judgment against and anger towards Israel was not to last forever. Thank him for that. Uh, when their hearts were turned away from their gross idolatry, God will change his disposition toward them. He says, because you did not remember the days of your youth, God repeats the idea from uh, Ezekiel 16.22, their self-destructive pride was based in their failure to remember that, that all the good they had was a blessing and gift from God. Everything we have that's good uh, is a blessing and it's a gift. It, we didn't earn it. It's a gift from God. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, verses uh, 44 through 45. It says, indeed. Everyone who quotes Proverbs will use this proverb against you. Like mother, like daughter, you are your mother's daughter, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters who loathe their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. 
like mother, like daughter. This proverb would actually uh, be actually uh, accurately said of Israel in Ezekiel's day. Uh, the idea is repeated. Uh, your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite, and Israel acted just like those pagan nations. You know, that's why it's so important as to who you uh, consort with, who you uh, run around with, who your friends are, because eventually uh, you are going to assume a lot of the characteristics of, your, uh, of those that you run with. And, the, and that are your friends. Uh, it says you are your mother's daughter. You are, your, are the sister of your sisters. God had called Israel to be different from the pagan nations. And instead she became just like them. He says who loathed their husbands. It's a strange and shocking that Israel would be like those who hated their husbands. Spiritually speaking, Yahweh was the covenant husband of Israel who was a perfect husband. This uh, bad marriage was entirely the responsibility of one party, not both. All right. Now the sisters of Jerusalem the harlot uh, verses 46 and 47 i'm going to take another sip here please excuse me your elder sister it says in verse 46 is Samaria who dwells with her daughters to the north of you and your younger sister who dwells to the south of you is Sodom and her daughters. You did not walk in their ways nor act according to their abominations, but as if they, that they were too little, you became more corrupt than they in your ways more corrupt than Sodom. <laughs> the elder sister in Samaria, here God focused on Jerusalem and the southern kingdom. It was the capital uh, of, the city of Samaria was the capital city of the long conquered northern kingdom of Israel. Once faithful, Jerusalem had become just as corrupt as her elder sister, uh, Samaria and then he mentions the younger sister is Sodom it was bad enough to be identified with Samaria uh, uh, but Jerusalem's state was far worse than that she was like Sodom with all her infamous corruptions can you imagine me, uh, you, your nation being compared or your city being compared to Sodom? I've heard of cities compared to Sodom in America. Uh, I wouldn't live there. But in our text, it says, but as if that were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all your ways. Even worse, Jerusalem became more corrupt then Sodom, this was a, a staggering accusation for God to make, yet it was true. Uh, she, she was worse. Uh. All right, verse 48 through 50. It's going to make a comparison here. Verse 48. As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they 
were haughty and, and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. All right. He said, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you. Introducing this word with a solemn vow, as I live. God repeated the accusation from the previous verse. He said, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Point by point, God listed some of the sins of Sodom. The sins listed here are alluded to in Genesis, uh, but not specifically uh, uh, detailed. Some wrongly take this to mean that God did not consider the sexual depravity uh, described in Genesis 19, 1 through 24 to be a sin. But this is a clear and willful misunderstanding of the text. Uh, these were sins at the root of depravity described in Genesis 19. And in addition to that, depravity. She and her daughter had pride. Uh, Genesis 13 10 says that the land of Sodom was like the garden of the Lord. It was the kind of city that citizens take great pride in. Uh, fullness of food and abundance of idleness being well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord. There was agricultural abundance in Sodom. This made them self-reliant, uh, sinfully independent, and overly invested in entertainments and comforts. Does that sound uh, familiar? You need to read Genesis 13 sometimes. Um, neither did the strength of the land of, of Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, the text says. With her great abundance, the people of Sodom should have been more generous in giving to the poor and needy. Yet in their selfishness and abundance of idleness, they were not generous or helpful says uh, they were haunty and committed abominations. Ancient Sodom was filled with pride and terrible idolatry. That's abomination. Uh, the sexual depravity de described in Genesis 19 was no doubt connected with the environment of unrestrained idolatry. Clear connection. Uh, committed abomination, th uh, that unusual filthiness which takes its name from this. This is the uh, Levant is not held a vice, and in Mexico, it is one of the Spanish virtues, says Trap. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. God brought his judgment to Sodom and he would bring it to Jerusalem and Judah, who in many ways were worse than Sodom. That's sad. Uh, that's sad. Uh, you have to wonder, are, are we the same in some ways? Verse 51 and 52. Now he does some comparison of Israel and Samaria. 51 and 52 reads like this. Samaria did not commit half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they and have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. Uh, you have judged your sisters, bear your own shame also because the sins which you committed were more abominable than theirs. They are more righteous than you. Yes, be disgraced also and bear your own shame because you justified your sisters. All right, it says Samaria did not commit half of your sins. Uh, since Samaria fell, 
uh, 130 years before Jerusalem, Judah had much more time uh, to do more sinning. As well, they had far more light with the presence of the temple, the institution of the priesthood, and better king. Uh, he says, in, and have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. Jerusalem's heart and deeds were so bad that it made Samaria and Sodom look justified in, compar in comparison. Doesn't mean that. literal here. Uh, he says, uh, you who judged your sisters bear your own shame also. Jerusalem and Judah proudly thought themselves better than Samaria and, and Sodom. Uh, but this proud judgment only made them guiltier. Uh, Jerusalem would be disgraced also and bear their own shame. Huh. All right, let's move on to verse 53 through 59. Here's a promise, a restoration for Jerusalem and her sisters. I'm going to take a little sip here. Excuse me. All right, beginning at verse 53, here's what it says. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> when I bring back their captives, the captives of Sodom and her daughters and the captives of Samaria and her daughters, then I will also bring back the captives of your captivity among them that you may bear your own shame and be disgraced by all that you did when you comforted them. When your sister Sodom and her daughters return to their former state uh, and Samaria and her daughters return to their former state, then you and your daughters will return to your former state. For your sister Sodom uh, was not a byword in your youth in the days of your pride before your wickedness was uncovered. It was like the time of the reproach of the daughters of Syria and all those around her and the daughters of the Philistines who despise you everywhere. You have paid for your lewdness and your abominations, says the Lord. And thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done. You despise the oath by breaking the covenant. It's a very important statement there. It says, all right, let's look at this closer. When I was back, when I bring back their captives, God promised some, some kind of restoration for Sodom and Samaria, and that Jerusalem would also be restored and their captives brought back. The promise to bring back the captives of Samaria is easily understood as we may see its fulfillment. The fulfillment of this promise to Sodom is more difficult to understand. Um, he says that you may bear your own shame. Part of the reason God promised to restore uh, captivity uh, the captivity of Samaria and Sodom was to humble Jerusalem and Judah. They would know that they were not the unique ob objects of God's favor and restoration. His love was wider than that. Thank you, Lord. Uh, all right, your sister Sodom was not a byword, it says. Uh, in former times, self-righteous Jerusalem would not even mention the name of Sodom. Uh, Jerusalem, however, was humble when her own wickedness was made public uh, through divine judgment. He said, you have paid for your lewdness and your abominations. The day would come when God's season of discipline and judgment over Jerusalem and Judah would pass. 
in some sense, cured of their previous idolatry. They could move forward in humility instead of pride. Pride. Uh, oh, but if we were more humble as a people, uh, America. Uh, verse 60 through 63, remembering the old covenant, promising an everlasting covenant here. Verse 60, it says, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish, establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and younger sister. Uh, for I will give them to you for daughters, but not because of my covenant with you, and I will establish my covenant with you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth any more because of your shame when I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord. He says, nevertheless, I will remember your ways and be ashamed. Uh, no, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, is what it says. Despite the certainty of the coming judgment, God would not forget his covenant uh, with Israel. They would continue to have a special place in his plan of the ages, therefore, uh, in his heart. He said, then you will remember your ways and be ashamed. The restoration would bring humility to Israel, not only toward God, but also towards those they had previously despised and judged when you receive your older and younger sisters, it said. And now it says, I, and I will establish my covenant with you. The idea is repeated again for emphasis. The coming judgment would be so great that Israel would be tempted to believe that there was no, no more hope for them with God. Yet again and again, Yahweh promised to establish his covenant with them. It says, when I provide an atonement for all you have done, through Ezekiel, the Lord hinted at the nature of the future covenant. The idea of a God-provided atonement is an important aspect of the new covenant already mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 11. This would be the true and ultimate restoration of Israel. So says chapter 16. To the end. We will pick up next week at chapter 17. I want to thank you for being with me. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed this study and reading God's Word. If nothing else, just the reading of the Word is a blessing, and I hope you feel that way too. Uh, if you, there is anything you question or uh, have comment about, just uh, Get in touch with me um, via email, or you can uh, let Peg know, and she'll uh, let me know in turn. So until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his, his eyes shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen.